Welcome back. This is the second part of the video lecture on quantitative bioanalysis. I will discuss the options to calculate the unknown concentration of an analyte in a sample by using calibration. Normally, we make use of the so-called calibration curve method, which is rather straightforward. If this doesn't work, there is also a possibility to use an alternative, called the standard addition method. The basic principle of calibration is that a set of calibrators with known concentrations is analyzed and that the unknown concentrations in a study sample is calculated by comparing its result to the results of the calibrators. We do this by measuring the response of the instrument that we use for each of the calibrators, which, as was discussed earlier, are samples with known concentrations of the analyte in the relevant matrix. And we need a proper reference substance to make the calibrators. The pro process of preparing a calibrator is called spiking, and we do this by adding a small volume of a solution of the analyte to an aliquot of the blank matrix. For small molecules, the reference substance typically is a powder, which we first need to dissolve in a suitable solvent to make a stock solution, that's often methanol or DMSO. To make sure that the composition of the spiked sample does not differ too much from a study sample, the amount of spiking solution is typically restricted to below 5% of the final sample volume. Let's have a look at an example. For risperidone, 1 mg of the reference substance is dissolved in 10 ml of methanol to produce a stock solution of 100 micrograms per mil. And this stock solution is further diluted to so-called standard solutions of lower concentrations, in this case 5000 550 nanograms per mil. Calibrators with concentrations between 0 0.1 and 250 nanograms per milliliter are prepared by adding small volumes of these standard solutions to blank plasma as is shown in this table. The response of the calibrators is measured and plotted as a function of the concentration. For LCMS this typically gives a straight line. If a study sample is now measured, it will also give a response, and the concentration of this sample is determined by comparing it to the response of the calibration curve. The response can be several things, but for chromatographic methods such as LCMS, it is usually the area or peak height uh, that corresponds to the analyte. Binding assays, such as ELISA, give nonlinear calibration curves, and in this case, the response typically is the intensity of the color that is produced during analysis. A very important aspect of quantitative bioanalysis by a chromatographic method is the use of a so-called internal standard, which compensates for the fluctuations in response from sample to sample. It's a gamma substance that is added to each sample in a constant amount. Theoretically, it will produce exactly the same response in all samples, but in practice it varies a bit from one sample to the other because of small experimental variations. A good internal standard will have similar properties as the analyte and therefore undergo the same variations. And of course we should be able to distinguish its response from that of the analyte. Let me show you an example. This HPLC UV chromatogram shows three major peaks. One of them represents the analyte, the propion, and another, the internal standard, timolol. The third peak is a metabolite of the drug, called hydroxypropion. If we analyze one sample 10 times, the peak area that we will get will vary a little bit, but as you can see the variation for bupropion and timolol is more or less the same, which means that the peak area ratio is almost constant. By using this peak area ratio, we will therefore get a much better precision than if we use the analyte peak area. It's also the reason why HPLC and LCMS methods usually are more precise than ELISA's, for example, because they cannot use an internal standard. Not every mo uh, molecule can be used as an internal standard. It's important that the responses of analyte and internal standard can be distinguished, for example by a good HPLC separation, such as in the case of uh, bupropion and timolol that I showed you, or by having a different molecular mass which will allow separate detection by LCMS. 
It's also essential that the fluctuations of analyte and internal standard are the same. Otherwise, the, other, uh, the internal standard will not properly compensate. And finally, also important, the internal standard should not naturally occur in, this, in the matrix, because then its concentration will not be the same for each sample. This means that endogenous compounds and molecules that are in use as drugs usually cannot be used as internal standards. For LCMS methods, the use of stable isotope label sta stable isotope labeled internal standard is widespread. These molecules are exactly the same as the analyte, but they contain a number of heavy atoms, such as deuterium instead of hydrogen, 13C instead of the normal 12C, or 15 N rather than 14N. Stable isotope labeled internal standards are ideal because they have exactly the same properties as the unlabeled analytes, but they give a separate response in the mass spectrometer because of the mass difference. If you have a look here at risperidone, it has a molecular weight of 410.5, and we use as an internal standard a molecule that contains three deuterium atoms and two 13C atoms and that has therefore a molecular weight of 5 units higher, at 415.5. The approach that I just described assumes that an analyte gives the same response in the calibration matrix and the study matrix, and very often that is the case, but sometimes the composition is different. For example, because the calibration matrix is taken from healthy volunteers, and the study matrix is from patients. Or, and this does happen uh, more often for uh, endogenous analytes, the calibration matrix is a surrogate matrix, such as a buffer, and the study matrix is plasma. In such a case, the calibration can be approached in a different way by the method of standard addition. Here is an example of such a situation. For an endogenous analyte, we had to use an uh, amino acid solution as the proxy matrix, and the slope of the calibration curve in this proxy matrix was quite different from the slopes in plasma. Therefore, we would get incorrect results if we had used this calibration curve for the calculation of plasma concentrations. The solution to this problem is to generate a calibration curve in each individual sample. We do this by splitting each study sample into different subsamples and prepare calibration calibrators using these different aliquots. In this way, we reconstruct a calibration curve that already contains the analyte when no extra amount is added. The intercept of this curve therefore is not equal to zero, and the analyte concentration in a sample can be determined from the point where the curve intersects the x-axis. An advantage of using standard addition is that it rules out any matrix effect. But there are also a number of drawbacks, because it takes more sample and more time, and more money than we can usually afford and the accuracy is less, because we extrapolate from a part of the curve without any data points. In summary, calibration is the basis of quantitative bioanalysis, and a reliable result can only be obtained when calibration is approached in a proper way. Internal standards are very important to correct for method variability. In the next part, we will discuss validation, or how do we demonstrate that the method is really reliable? See you soon.